there are, generally speaking, two ways of life that are blessed in the Orthodox Church. Marriage and monasticism. Um, and these are the two ways of living in which we are normally called to live out the Christian life. Of the two, of course, marriage is the most common. Uh, but it is wrong to therefore think of Christian marriage as something less than a calling and a sacrament of the church, and therefore a sacramental life, a life of offering self-sacrifice. Unfortunately, it is not uncommon for Orthodox Christians to think of, while thinking of monasticism as the religious and spiritual ideal, um, to equate marriage with a sort of compromise, uh, to associate asceticism with monasticism alone, not with marriage. <laughs> But both marriage and monasticism are uh, equally ascetic in as much as they, they both demand self-sacrifice, uh, a sort of sacrifice of the will, of, the, of, the, of your own selfish will for the sake of another. And that's why these are the two ways of life that are considered the ideals uh, in the church. Both are everlasting commitments to someone or something outside ourselves. Um, now that's not to say that there, there can be no exceptions. Um, there are those who are neither married nor monastics, but who have, you know, for example, I know people who have you know, dedicated their whole life to looking after a disabled child or a you know, member of the family and so on, and in fact sacrifice the prospect of marriage for that. And that's obviously even more of a sacrifice. So we shouldn't, when I talk about marriage and monasticism as the ideals and the sacrificial life, we're only speaking generally. Um, there are obviously exceptions to this. Sorry. Right. Um, likewise, there are clergy who are neither married nor tonsured monks, but who have dedicated themselves completely to the church. Uh, but it still remains the case that uh, marriage and monasticism are the norms, and for good reason. Everyone, of course, is capable of asceticism and self-sacrifice, but marriage and monasticism provide a framework, a way of living, and they are therefore the sh safest and surest forms um, of, of living the Christian life. And in this connection, I would like to point out that you know the Orthodox Church has never really embraced the idea of um, of celibacy, priestly celibacy, as an alternative to marriage or monasticism. Um, priesthood, in fact, is not strictly speaking a way of life, um, and the life of a a young educated priest in a place like London is different to you know, a, a priest in a village in, in Cyprus and so on. Um, without the stability of a family or a monastic community, many temptations and difficulties can arise from priestly celibacy. It doesn't give you anything necessarily stable. Um, that's why, for the most part, clergy are drawn from those who are already settled in the, either the married life or the monastic life. Um, but of the two, of marriage and monasticism, I mean, we said before that you know, we don't normally number sacraments. Everything in the church is sacramental. But of the two, marriage is far, you know, regarded much more as a sacrament. Um, I just said before that a lot of people seem to think monasticism is, is far superior. But when you look at it in terms of a sacrament, clearly marriage is given a lot more importance than monasticism. It's of the two, it's the one that's considered most of all a sacrament. But why is it a sacrament of the church? What makes it a sacrament? <clears throat> and it's difficult to answer the question when you consider the, the modern approach to marriage. This includes, oddly enough, often the Christian approach. There's an alarming trend nowadays to, to make the priest some sort of religious registrar or marriage counsellor. Um, and we have all these you know, cosy definitions in church, you know, leaflets and so on, about Christian family, moderate use of sex, moral upbringing of children, uh, Sunday school and so on. But there seems to be real no, not, not really entering into the real depth of marriage as a sacrament of the church. Because we forget that marriage, like everything else in this world, is a fallen marriage. And it needs not simply to be blessed and solemnized after a rehearsal and help of the photographer, but to be restored, uh, to be incorporated into the church, and to become the journey to and the life of the kingdom of God. And my point 
real point is this. As long as we see marriage as relevant only to those being married and not to the whole church, we can never understand the meaning of marriage as sacrament. Um, for centuries, Christianity has often seemed to reduce marriage to a legalization of sexual relations and its purpose to procreation Christian family. But the real purpose of the sacrament of marriage is not family, but love. And it's actually quite wrong, in my opinion, though some, a lot of people would not agree with me. Uh, it's wrong to condemn uh, no, civil marriage as fornication, as many Christians, even some Orthodox, do. Because the sacrament of marriage is not uh, the legalization of sexual relations. That's actually what civil marriage is. That's why it's a legal thing, that you are legally uh, together as a couple. Um, but the sacrament of marriage is different. But when I say that the purpose of the, the sacrament of marriage is love, I'm not talking about the kind of sentimental nonsense we see in Hollywood movies. Uh, I mean divine love, Christian love. And Christian love is ascetic and sacrificial. Uh, Christ has shown us the true nature of love. He showed it to us above all through the cross. Um, there's nothing sentimental about Christian love. It's as hard as nails. It requires you know, strength of spirit, courage, sacrifice. Um, whereas, you know, the sort of all this you know, optimistic, idealistic kind of stuff we see in films is just, it, it's, not, it's not really realistic in my opinion. And one of the great errors of our times, I think, is that people seem to equate marriage with happiness. And the idea that a, mari a marriage in which there is struggle, pain, arguments, and so on, is a marriage not worth having. Now, don't think that I mean that there's something wrong with a couple being happy, of course. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with the couple loving each other passionately, romantically, sexually something wrong with being in love, that, that's needed. You know, marriage is more than two friends agreeing to live together, there's obviously something more. But it's not what really makes a marriage truly meaningful and lasting, in fact. There was a wonderful description of marriage by the Russian theologian Alexander Shmemen. Um, I want to read this because, you know, usually the image we're given of a married couple in movies and magazines is, you know, some youthful couple, uh, you know, really romantic and passionate. But Alexander Schmemann described his ideal vision of marriage. He said, Once, in the light and warmth of an autumn afternoon, I saw on the bench of a public square, in a poor Parisian suburb, an old and poor couple. They were sitting hand in hand, in silence, enjoying the pale light, the last warmth of the season, in silence. All words had been said, all passions exhausted, all storms at peace. The whole of life was behind them. Yet all of it was now present in this silence, in this light, in this warmth, in this silent unity of hands, present and ready for eternity, ripe for joy. This to me remains the vision of marriage of its heavenly beauty. The true meaning of the sacrament of matrimony is not that it merely gives a religious sanction to marriage and family, that it reinforces supernatural, with supernatural grace the natural family values. Its meaning is that by taking the natural marriage into the great mystery of Christ and the Church, the sacrament of matrimony gives marriage a new meaning. It transforms, in fact, not only marriage itself, but all Christian love. All human love, sorry. Um, and I say this because there is a tendency, you know, people always talk about secularism, for example, in the Church. And people seem to make this mistake and they think that secularism is basically the absence of religion. This is not the case. Secularism is where it takes religion but gives it a secular agenda or criteria. Um, so, for example, people would separate, um, they, they, would, they would come to the church to have their family, their, their, their marriage blessed, but their, their, mo their criteria for marriage would still be very secular. Improving your life or you know, whatever it is. It's still not about a sacrament. It's not about the idea of incorporating that into the church as a whole. And it's worth noting in this connection that the early church apparently had no marriage service. Um, the church always acknowledged and accepted civil marriage. 
so uh, it's, it still amazes me that you know, people uh, have this reaction against civil marriage. Um, I'm not saying that it's okay to just have a civil marriage. I'm saying that <coughs> the reason we don't like it, it's, it's wrong to not get married in the church. It's not that it's fornication if you're only civilly married. It's that, you know, like I said, that the idea of marriage is that bring it, bring it into the body of the church. If to not get married in the church is effectively saying, this is a sphere of my life that has nothing to do with God. So my married life is governed by other criteria. And I might go to church on Sundays, I might, you know, say my prayers, but at the same time, this is, where real, this is what real secularism is. It's basically saying the, the things that govern my family life or my profession, it's like these things are autonomous. They don't come into the field of religion and church. I go to church, but I'm not going to bring it home with me. You know? And so basically not getting married in church is basically saying God has nothing to do with my marriage. So obviously we need to marry in church, but not, not for the, the reason that it's, it's fornication if you don't do it. So, yes, going back to my point, the early church had no marriage service. When a Christian couple wanted to marry, they would get the blessing of the, the bishop, They'd be married by the civil authorities and they would come to the liturgy and they would take Holy Communion together in the church. And just as every aspect of life was gathered into the Eucharist, so marriage received its seal by inclusion into this central act of the community. And as I will mention later, when the service, marriage of, uh, service of marriage did develop, it was not a private ceremony. It took place during the divine liturgy in front of the whole congregation like baptism when we talked about baptism I said it wasn't just some family in the corner of the church it took place during the liturgy it's the same with marriage and if you become acquainted with the structure of the liturgy and the structure of marriage which you'll see they're very very similar that you still have the same structure you have the epistle reading you have a gospel reading you have the holy cup the, 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 um, the common cup which was once holy communion um, and uh, this is important because again it reminds us you know, we've privatized our sacraments. As the moment we separated these sacraments from the liturgy, the, I think people have become very confused about their meaning. Um, and they've ended up having all kinds of different definitions and symbols attached to them. But we've forgotten that this isn't a private ceremony. This is, this is part of being the body of Christ. Um, and so the marriage, as I'll, I'll explain in the service later, wasn't just about the couple at all. It was a much bigger thing than that. Um, and obviously, of course, when marriage was during, uh, taking place during the liturgy, mixed marriages were impossible. You could not marry uh, someone who is not orthodox because you have to take, to take communion in the church, you have to be orthodox. Since we did divorce the marriage from the, the liturgy, mixed marriages became a possibility. Um, and obviously that was a, a pastoral need we had to respond to but on the other hand like I said the moment we separated the sacraments from the Eucharist I think there was something of a deterioration in our understanding of, of church sacraments but perhaps it was inevitable but anyway I want to really spend most of the rest of today take, talking you through the service um, and explaining what it, what it all means and then the marriage service is like baptism, sort of one of two halves. We have the first part is the betrothal ceremony. And this was originally completely separate from marriage. Um, this was basically the engagement ceremony. Uh, today, though, they are collapsed into one. Um, and its main feature is the blessing and exchange of the rings, which are, of course, you know, rings are not exclusive to Christian uh, symbolism. Rings are always a sign of promise, lifelong commitment of eternity and so on but um, the biblical significance of the rings is mentioned in this wonderful prayer of the betrothal service I was intending actually to do a handout and get you guys to read some of this so you didn't have to listen to my boring voice but I forgot so I'll read them myself uh, we hear this prayer uh, in the betrothal service by a ring Authority was, given, uh, authority was given to Joseph in Egypt. By a ring, Daniel was glorified in the country of Babylon. By a ring, the truth of Thamar was revealed. By a ring, our heavenly father showed compassion to the prodigal son. For he said, put a ring on his right hand and bring out and slay the fatted calf and let us eat and be joyful. 
It was your right hand, Lord, that armed Moses at the Red Sea, for through your true word the heavens were made firm and the earth set on its foundations, and the right hand of your servants will be blessed by your mighty word and by your upraised arm. Therefore, Master, with your heavenly blessing, now bless also this putting on of rings, and may an angel of the Lord go before them all the days of their lives. So we can see that, again, like when we talked about confession, I talked about that prayer there, the person in the sacraments immediately directly connected to the saints of the Bible. And we have this again in, in the marriage service, that we're reminded of the significance of rings and of the, of the promises that were bestowed through, through a ring. Uh, and it also illustrates, of course, a lot of people say they want to have services explained to them. You know, and marriage is the, the one that always makes me realize if you don't know the scriptures, you can't understand the services. These are all biblical references. Of course, no one knows uh, what they are unless you're familiar with the Bible. And the reason that this is always talking about the right hand is because actually in, in the Orthodox tradition, the, the wedding ring is worn on the right hand rather than the left. But a lot of people uh, here opt for the left hand because we're in England. When in, Rome do as, when in Rome do as the Romans do. Who, knows, who, who, invent, who, who came up with that phrase? Does anyone know? When in Rome do as the Romans do. St. Ambrose of Milan. He was the person who taught Augustine and baptised Augustine. And he said it to Augustine regarding fasting. Because um, there were different practices of fasting. And he said that when you're in Rome, fast as the Romans do. That's where it came from. Not many people know that. Now, after the betrothal ceremony, we then have what we call the marriage proper, the marriage uh, ceremony, the crowning ceremony. And like I said, this begins as the divine liturgy. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, after we have, you know, similar to the liturgy, uh, the liturgy, we have the great litany, we have. Uh, Three prayers, which I read, which resemble the antiphons and the liturgy. And then we, I guess, the, we then come to the joining of the hands, where, um, uh, again, there's a prayer that, that the priest reads and joins uh, the couple together, um, which illustrates that the couple, of course, come voluntarily, but it is the church which, which joins the people together. It doesn't matter how much they may love each other, and want, you know, without the church, the blessing of the church, it's not a marriage. By the way, I should I want to point out that the idea of them coming together is actually very strong in the Orthodox service. Unfortunately in this country people insist on Anglicanizing our services. They want the father to give the bride away and all of this. That's not an Orthodox practice at all. I mean the, the bride is given away outside of the church when they arrive, but the couple actually come into the church together. And this is very important because it shows that the marriage is not valid if, it's, if they are not both willingly uh, entering in marriage together. The, wife, the woman's not a piece of property that's given away to be the property of the father, to be the property of the husband. That's what the giving away of the bride means. And it amazes me that women insist on, on, on this being done. But the Orthodox ceremony is actually far more in tune with, with modern thinking than, than that is. That uh, they, they have to be uh, come together voluntarily to be married, but it's still, they come to be joined by the church. Um, and the joining of the hands is followed by the crowning, so the, the placing of the crowns upon the heads. And we, we sing, Lord our God, crown them with honour and glory. And the crowns have you know, various meanings. First of all, crowns have always been symbols of uh, achievement or, or victory. Like in the Olympics, they still put crowns on the heads of the winning athletes. And it's a similar thing here, you know, that marks this uh, achievement in your life. They're also, of course, symbols of kingship, because from now on there's the idea that the man and woman are king and queen of their own household, that, you know, they're, they're more independent, they've left their families, and they're starting their own domestic church, if you like. But they are also crowns of martyrdom. There's constant reference to martyrdom in the service of marriage. Yes, it's a very joyful ceremony, but we're also reminded it's about uh, sacrifice as well. Um, that you have to sacrifice your own will for the sake of the other. And, you know, the couple may fail time and again to live up to these ideals, but for as long as they stay together, there's always a possibility that uh, they will uh, they 
will you know, live up to that ideal. Um, and then the crowning is followed by a reading from St. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians. And I want to go through this because it's very contentious and it's widely misunderstood, this reading. Um, again, I was hoping someone else... Actually, Alex, you want to read this? Yes. I'm bored of talking. Right there. Yes. <clears throat> Loud and clear. Brethren, give thanks at all times for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, making yourselves subjects to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives be subjects to your own husbands, as to the Lord, because the husband is head of the wife, as Christ too is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so wives must be also to their own husband in everything. Husbands, love your own wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that might uh, he sacrifice her, having purified her with the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church of himself glorious, without spot or wrinkle or anything similar, but that she might be holy and unblemished. Thus, husbands must love their own wives like their own bodies. One who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one hates their own flesh, their own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as the Lord does the church, because we are members of his body, from his flesh and from his bones. For this reason, a man will abandon his father and mother and be attached to his wife, and the two shall become one in flesh. This is a great mystery, I mean concerning Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife respect her husband. Thank you. Now, St. Paul is comparing the relationship between husband and wife between the relationship between Christ and the church. And... It's no coincidence that we often refer to the church as the bride of Christ and the church as the bridegroom, uh, Christ as the bridegroom of the church. And St. Paul begins by stating, he addresses the wife first and says, she should therefore respect and obey the husband. This is where the women start scoffing and the men start giggling. And they completely ignore the rest of the epistle, which most of it is addressed to the men, to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Anybody? Come on, how did Christ love the church? Sacrifice his life for the church. The one and only correct answer. Tell him what is one of you know. <laughs> he humbled himself. He sacrificed himself to the point of death. Um, and that's how husbands should love their wives. Um, there's no point. Husbands have no right to expect obedience and love from their wives if they're not going to love them like that. Um, so yes, I mean, let's also note at the beginning of the reading, it says, before he even addresses the wives, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So it's a mutual thing. He starts explaining to the women how they should be subject to the husband, but then also explains how the husband should be humble and subject himself to the wife as well. Um, So just as Christ and the church are united together in love, so too should the husband and wife. And St. Paul says, this is a great mystery. I mean concerning Christ and the church. It's not marriage or marital love that St. Paul says is a great mystery. It's the union of Christ and the church, which is reflected in marriage. Marriage is like a, a microcosm of the church. Um, if the church is basically about us being one body and being joined with Christ, then marriage is an even greater example of it. The, the life of marriage, which is why it's a sacrament, is basically a way of actually living out the reality of, of the church on a daily basis. And so, in as far as marriage imitates the kingdom of God, imitates Christ in the church, it is a mystery, a mysterion, a sacrament of the church. But nowhere is the misunderstanding of this epistle reading more clear than in this horrible Greek custom of the man stepping on the woman's foot at the last line and let the wife respect her husband. Sorry? The man steps on the woman. But yeah, women have started stepping on the men now because they <laughs> like to get their own back. That's what it's always been. It's not always been like that. In Greece it is. No, 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 it's not. The man stepping on the woman? Yeah, it's been done for ages. <laughs> <never> yeah. seen, <laughs> they've turned it around now. 
No, I mean, it's, it's been it's been a practice for a long time, but nowadays, obviously, it, it's done as a joke, and now a lot of women step on the man as a result. But the 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 problem is, it, it shows that they haven't listened to a word of the epistle. Um, <laughs> you know, the the word for the for respect in Greek, of course, is is fear, and I guess in old English and in biblical language, that does not mean uh, fear as we understand. It usually means respect, the way you might you know, but. Uh, it does not mean that the the wife or the husband are to be treated like a slave or a servant. Uh, it's been spelled out very clearly what, what it should be like. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. They should love their wives as their own bodies. Whoever loves his wife loves himself. No one hates his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it as the Lord does the church because we are members of his body. Um, so it's, one, it's a relationship of mutual uh, love and respect in the fear of God. Um, and the epistle reading is followed by a reading from St. John's Gospel, the first miracle Christ performed, uh, the wedding at Cana of Galilee. Uh, and we read, there, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the marriage. When the wine ran out, Jesus' his mother said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, why do you trouble me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. Now there were six stone jars standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, holding twenty or thirty gallons each. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward of the feast. And they took it. When the chief steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, he summoned the bridegroom and said to him, everyone puts out the good wine first, but when people are drunk, then he puts out the worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. This was the beginning of the sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So just as the first thing God does after creation is bless the union between man and woman, so the first thing Christ does when he begins his ministry is bless the union between man and woman. Everyone puts out the good wine first, and when people are drunk, then he puts out the worse, but you have kept the good wine until now. In other words, the best things in life are yet to come. When passion and romance have gone, have been exhausted, better things should follow. People, like I said, when we have these, the ideals of marriage that we see presented in films and so on, it's all about the young couple, the romance, the passion. But what we forget is that well, when that, that, that inevitably goes, when that goes, what comes next? It should be better after that, not worse. Unfortunately, marriage almost seems to be presented as a, a downhill uh, journey. Um, but it should be the other way around. It should be the other way around. Um, now, shortly after the Gospel reading, we have the blessing of the common cup, and the couple drink from it. Now, I said that this was originally the Eucharist. This was communion. The couple took communion together. But obviously that's not the case anymore. It's been separated from the liturgy. It's only symbolic. It's a symbol of the common life, of the shared life together. Because the couple are no longer individuals, they belong to one another. There's no longer his and hers. There's only ours. They're to share in all things, good times, bad times, joys and sorrows. And this is followed immediately by, uh, immediately by the procession around the marriage altar, what is called the Isaiah's dance. They uh, say, so And that's because the, the first hymn of the first of the three hymns chanted refer to Isaiah. Isaiah danced, the virgin has conceived and given birth to a son, Emmanuel, who is both God and man. Orient is his name, whom we magnify as we call the virgin blessed. Then to the martyrs, again, reference to the martyrs' crowns. Holy martyrs, we fought the good fight and were crowned. Intercede for the Lord to have mercy on our souls. And then glory to you, Christ, God, boast of apostles, joy of martyrs, whose preaching was the consubstantial trinity. Um, so the significance of this procession is obviously, of course, from now on, the couple would always walk together in life, never alone. But it also shows they will walk in the ways of God's commandments, of the gospel, of, mar of the martyrs, self-sacrifice, and so on. So, you know, there's, it's, marriage is both, it's very solemn, it's very serious, and it's joyful at the same time. Um, a lot of the time... And I've been to some marriages which are just so chaotic and there's, there's no sense of any reverence for the service at all. And others where it's almost like a funeral. Um, um, yes? What about the practice of spraying the newlyweds with rice during the Isaiah's 
Yeah, there's nothing to do with the marriage it's service at all. Um, it's one of those customs that have been thrown, added in, but it's nothing to do with the ceremony. Um, I mean, you know, and most people here do it outside the church. I think in a lot of places in Greece they do it inside the church. But it has nothing to do with service at all. Yeah, um, yeah I, really, I never understood the point of that, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So Express their joy. I don't know. It's about uh, because uh, the, the spring rice, right? Mm. Because in Greek, rizi, they, they say that if you spray rizi, the uh, the vegetable is very Oh, I see. Oh. You can even no Greek to understand. It's very really weird name. Well, <laughs> they should be throwing grass roots. Really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the relationship is yeah. It's very funny. Really? Like, it's one of these things. The walnuts can knock you out. <laughs> <laughs> in Corfu, they throw walnuts apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Big ones. Wow. And what? In Cyprus, they throw bricks. Do <laughs> <laughs> they? No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, before I leave the subject of marriage and go on considerably more briefly to the sacri- to uh, monasticism. Well, I may, I may leave monasticism out altogether, I don't know. I um, just want to say a couple of things, uh, sort of as footnotes, really, to this. One is on divorce, and I didn't really, I wasn't sure whether to, to talk about this, but I feel I should. Um, there's a big misconception that, you know, pe- I've heard of many Greek people, you know, they, someone's getting married and say, they say, don't worry, if it doesn't work out, you, you can marry three times in the Orthodox Church. And it's a real misunderstanding of this. It's one thing to give people a second or a third chance, but it's, it, this, it does not mean that we do not take, consider marriage lifelong and yeah, very seriously. Um, unfortunately, people have sort of started to view it in the sense that, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting divorced and so on. Obviously, that's not the case. Um, the reason we allow divorce. Is, is you know in very serious circumstances when a marriage has simply ceased to be a reality. There is no point in in insisting, um, and it's based actually on on the words of Christ. He says, if a man divorces his wife for any cause other than an un, uh, unchastity or adultery, and marries another, he commits adultery. So he was making an exception. He said other than unchastity. So he, as far as uh, our Lord was uh, concerned regarding the law of Moses. Um, if someone committed adultery, that was uh, permission. You had permission to divorce those people, and the church allows it also for other serious reasons. When there are cases where you know, obviously, there's abuse um, or you know other very serious matters, um, you know, we we do give people a second chance or a third chance. After the third time, we just figure you're not cut out for marriage. Forget it. <laughs> um, but it's simply we're just trying to. To help people that when they, when things just really don't work out, we we allow divorce. But that's not to say that we do not take marriage extremely seriously. We believe it to be a lifelong thing. Another thing I just want to briefly mention, and I'm treading on risky material now. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about contraception within marriage. Now, I said before that family is not the sole purpose of marriage and of sex within marriage. Now, it is true that it is generally assumed that marriage will lead to family. It should not be assumed that sexual relations within marriage, however, are permissible only for the purpose of procreation. Um, And for this reason, the the Orthodox Church doesn't actually have an official position on the subject of contraception. There are various views. There are some who are very conservative and just condemn it outright. Uh, But there are others who are far more lenient towards it and say it can be used in certain circumstances. Now, um, and obviously there's, and I think it's right the church doesn't take an official position on a lot of these issues. A lot of people put pressure on the church. They say, you know, anything on bioethics, you must have a position. And it's very dangerous to take an immediate position, especially when things that we don't know enough about, especially even from scientists, and things that are still under development. And then to take a position and then apply it to everybody is it's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, there are, for example, I know of, I've heard of cases where the woman had you know, serious health problems where pregnancy could lead to death and so on. 
and where they were granted permission to to use contraception. I even heard, I was very surprised by this, um, there was a case in Cyprus uh, after the invasion uh, the church of Cyprus apparently officially gave its blessing for women who had been raped to have an abortion. And abortion is widely condemned in the Orthodox Church. But even there, the church saw we should make an exception in this case. Um, and these things are very, you know, very, very delicate matters. Well, they are. Uh, very well, delicate matters. So. Yeah. It, and it's very difficult. Um, and also, of course, with contraception, there are different forms. There's you know, preventive contraception, but there's also a proactive contraception, which destroy conception. And even those who are lenient on the subject of contraception would have serious reservations about those forms. So it's not a straightforward issue. Um, but, you know, like I said, we should not think, have such a strict view that it comes to the point where if there's no um, a chance of a of a pregnancy that you know uh, sex is somehow wrong in within marriage um, as though the you know, contraception is just unacceptable under any circumstances it's it, it doesn't work that way but it's a very much an open issue but I think that it needs a lot of this is where we said last week when we talked about the spiritual father perhaps somewhere where it's good to get advice fortunately though I mean there are some spiritual fathers who not very sensible with such subjects. Um, and unfortunately, I'm, it's, I'm sad to say that when it comes to these sort of subjects like sex and contraception, we really need, we, Christians really need to grow up. I mean, it's ridiculous that these sort of things are still almost taboo subjects. Um, you try to talk to a priest or a monk, especially a monk, you know, and they'll start and they're blushing and they're too embarrassed to discuss it. It's like, you know... This is stuff people deal with all the time. You have to start taking it seriously. Unfortunately, this has not been the case. I mean, for example, in Greece, I don't know if it's changed. I mean, this is, for me, it's, it's shocking. The Church of Greece is vehemently opposes sex education in schools. There's no sex education in school. And then they wonder why the, Greece has the highest abortion rate in Europe. It's like, it doesn't take a genius to work it out, you know? Um, so, you know, we have to be more sensible with these sort of subjects. They're probably just too embarrassed. I don't know. I don't understand that. They seem to think if they talk about sex in, in education in school, that it's going to therefore encourage children to have sex or tell them it's okay. Um, I mean, I can understand there's that danger. I mean, here now in England, you know, that has happened to a degree. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but it's just as dangerous to not even tell people because the other thing is the church has to face up to reality. I mean, do, does the Church of Greece not accept the reality that most people are at it anyway, whether you want them to or not? And if they're doing that, surely it's better to give, to sort of prevent them at least from unwanted pregnancies and abortions than to not talk to them at all about it. That's my opinion. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, I'm not claiming to be standing up for the entire Orthodox Church on this, but it's something I think that we need to get over this embarrassment about the subject at least and take it seriously anyway I've gone on quite a long time already but I want to talk now briefly about monasticism because I said before that uh, marriage and monasticism have a lot in common um, so I should uh, talk a bit about this and of course monasticism has played a major role in the church uh, from the very beginning now there are two basic models in the monastic life. There's what we call the hermetic life, which is basically the life of a hermit in isolation, which is very rare now, but it, it was really a big, in the 4th century, St. Antin the Great, who started it off and went into the wilderness. The second of the, the cenobitic, the uh, gnovio, uh, the, the, um, the idea of a community, a monastic community living together, which is uh, the more common mode. Now, I mean, for example, we're talking about the Hermetic life. Like I said, St. Anthony is the one who started it. And he, he was a simple man. And the first time he heard the gospel was in church. He heard the words of Christ to the rich ruler. Go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. You shall have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And he was from that moment said, that's what I'm going to do. 
and he converted on, uh, in, a, in an instant. And he lived a, a life of uh, prayer and asceticism in the wilderness. And this was the this form of monasticism did entail a isolation from the world, going out into the desert. Um, but there's another important aspect of this form of monasticism, and of monasticism in general, which is overlooked. After like something like 20 odd years in the wilderness, on his own, um, somehow people had heard of this Saint Anthony, this holy person in the desert. And and after these many years of isolation, he actually opened his doors to the world, and then people came from miles around to visit him, uh, to know for his advice. He, he, you know, he worked miracles and, and all kinds of things. And I reiterate this because it shows this principle, which is ignored, of leaving the world in order to return to the world, or to perceive the world. Um, the underlying principle of monasticism is that after many years of prayer and asceticism and enlightenment, you are able to be a light to others. Right? So it shouldn't just be understood as, as escaping from the world. There's always this idea of being the light of the world. And the same principle was followed by the founder of Cenobitic monasticism, which was St. Basil the Great. And this was the most, still is the most common form. It's the idea of a small monastic community with a shared life of work and prayer and resources. And St. Basil, as well, he spent many years as a monk in the wilderness. But then later, he chose to leave the monastery and return to the world to become a bishop and a priest. Um, so that's the same principle. And one of his greatest achievements was what is called the Basiliad, the Basiliada. And he actually set up uh, a monastic community, but which was not cut off uh, in isolation. It wasn't rural, it was urban. And he didn't just focus on prayer, but was actually, he worked with doctors um, and nurses and so on. And they, they uh, looked after the sick, uh, the poor, they set up orphanages. And it was this engaged monasticism. Uh, and basically what he was doing is that he saw the ideals, the monastic ideals of a shared life, resources and prayer. How that should be brought to bear on the whole of society. That... For him, that vision of the Basilad was, this is how every society should work. Sharing everything, a life of prayer. And it, did, it, it wasn't just about you know, going off into the wilderness. It was also about um, being the light of the world as well. Um, unfortunately, this idea of monasticism isn't so strong. Today, I guess, monasteries seem to be focused more on what is called hesychasm. Uh, and its greatest exponent was St. Gregory Palamas in the 14th century. And it's based on the life of prayer and contemplation to the exclu exclusion of almost everything else. Um, and there seems to be a bit of an identity crisis, I think, with the, the monasteries. They can't decide. On the one hand, they want to be sarcastic. On the other hand, they seem to like want to publish books and CDs and talk about, you know, speak out on issues. It's like, you know... You're going to be engaged with the world, or you're not going to be engaged with the world. It doesn't seem to make up its mind what it wants to do. Um, but basically, anyway, both the, the monasteries have their role to play, just like the, the parishes do. Um, but, you know, we are usually called to one of these two ways of life, and I hope now you can understand why these are the two, two ideals that it's ultimately about, through these forms of life, we learn to love others. Um, even in the case of hermetic uh, monasticism, there was still, wasn't this idea of, I leave the world because I hate it. I leave the world because I love it, and I will return to it, but able to help it more. Um, and so basically, yes, the, these are the, the, the ideals, because through these uh, forms of life, we learn to engage more fully uh, with the world as, as Christians and to, to improve our spiritual life. Now I've gone on too long, so I am happy to take questions. I'm sure you have many. Yes, I was in this, I can't remember where it was, I think it was near an LSL or somewhere. But uh, these, you could see the holes. Oh, that's where it was, it was near the monastery, where the monasteries were. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, there were the caves, you know, you could really. 
so that went up. But there were flags. I, I can't remember. Somebody told me the reason why they put flags something outside the entrances on some days of the year. But I just forgot not. They put flags outside the entrances of the monastery? No, of the, of the caves. Of the caves? Of the caves where the hermits used Caves to. never sat. Yeah. Was it a national flag? I, I, do you know what? I can't remember. It was flags or something. So, it could have, I mean, I don't know, but it could have just been one of those, you know, national holidays, a, a public yeah. holiday, and, and they may have been, you know, with everyone else celebrating it. I doubt it was a permanent feature. There. No, no, it wasn't. Yeah. No, it, was just a, it was probably something like that. Yeah. But I mean, I was just wondering how they actually got up there anyway. Oh, how they got up there? Oh, I was just wondering how they actually got up there. I mean, I wouldn't know. <laughs> it's just something that's quite a, quite a distinct thing because even the, the, the monarch was, they would know better than I do, but. Um, when you see where, where some of the monasteries are, so you must have had absolute faith to build them there at the first place. Yeah, yeah, and some of them are very difficult. Lock, 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 lock. There are some where they, I don't know what they do, it's like the baskets and they ropes, yeah. and they, they go up and down like that. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you, when you say apostolic canon, are you thinking of what St. Paul says where he says that he would prefer everyone to be like I am, i.e. celibate? That's from his uh, epistles. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there was a canon uh, that was published after one of the canons that he was published. Hmm? No, 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 I don't know, I, I, I long lost interest in canons. <laughs> you may know better than I do. But, um, not, not that I'm aware of. But, um, there, there, I mean, the, the, whether someone gets married or not, it's been a question even ancient Greek philosophers always ask, let alone Christians. Um, it just, like I said, it depends. So both of them are callings. Um, you should remember as well when uh, something Christ said, when he was talking about, it's a, one of those weird uh, passages where he uses the term eunuch, um, but to describe someone called a celibacy, he said some are made eunuchs by men, uh, and some are uh, born eunuchs or something um, and he says you know, not everyone can accept this saying except those to whom it is given basically what he's saying is that only a select few are called to the celibate life um, so but then a lot of people seem to think that marriage is not a calling either uh, because it's more common but I think it should be seen as a calling too um, even if it is a common one I think it's still it's still a calling. Um, but so with, the, with these things, you know, each person has to make up their mind for themselves, and sometimes they have the guidance of a spiritual father. Uh, but I mean, it should always be the motivation should always be a positive one. Uh, it's very dangerous when people adopt monasticism or celibacy um, because they simply don't want to be married because they simply don't want the responsibility. Or they want to be monks because they just don't like the world. You know, these, these are not reasons uh, to embrace monasticism. You have to love prayer, you have to love people. Um, uh, otherwise, it's, you know, it's, 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 no, you know, this, it's, the motivation is not a Christian one. You know? And bear in mind for a long time as well, especially in early Christianity, um, People don't realise how much uh, things changed for women, women when Christianity came along. It was the first time in Roman history where women could actually choose whether or not to marry. Um, but for a while, there was still so much pressure on women to marry someone they didn't. A lot of them elected a monastic life to get away from those unwanted marriages. Uh, that's why, in fact, I think the first form of monasticism, actually, at least organised monasticism, was female monasteries, the convents. Um, like, but I said, you know, okay, that a lot of women did that, and I understand it. But you know, like I said, it should, it should because you want that life, not because you don't want another life. So, if a person marries fourth time in a Christian Orthodox church, mm. is that a really bad thing? You, 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 you can't, can't marry a fourth time. Okay. 
Um, or if you marry like once in the church and then you decide, okay, I'm divorced, and then if you marry in a registry office. Well, so that, this, <laughs> this depends on where you are and what the bureaucracy is like. Um, see, in this country, they don't rec the state does not recognize orthodox marriages. And I think our archdiocese is not really? recognized. Uh, you have to have a state, you have to have yeah, a civil ceremony the separately. Time, yeah. Yeah. Either at the same time with the reg you know, yeah, in the uh, ceremony or in a registry office separately. Um, our archdiocese, rightly or wrongly, doesn't seem to really count civil marriage as a marriage. Uh, whereas in Greece and Cyprus, for example, they do. So if you've had three civil marriages, they won't marry you. So it depends on where you go. Um, but in any case, you can't, in, the, in this country, you can't get married without the civil ceremony. And you can't get divorced ecclesiastically without the civil divorce. So, you know, you can't actually, if you want to... I mean, however many times you get married in a civil court, a, a civil a ceremony, you know, that we, we can't have any say on that. You can do what you like. And you can get married in a Hindu temple and have a Roman Catholic one, do what you like. But uh, if you were divorced uh, and then you wanted to come and get married again, we would still, you'd have to be divorced both civilly and ecclesiastically to, to do that. It's like you're already planning it. <laughs> I was just thinking of my mum. Like she's been married three times, and the first time. Well, you see, for a long time, time in many places. And the third time back yeah, yeah. in the church. So I, I was so young to kind of know the ins and outs. What happens in the occasion where, um, uh, say, for example, somebody gets married and once or twice, and it happens that the other, uh, the husband or the wife, uh, uh, dies? Oh, we allow re remarriage in those okay. cases, but yes, uh, I think it's just with divorce. Okay, I'm not sure though. With no, I think, it's I think yeah, yeah, it's think still three times, isn't it? Yeah, I guess by good. then we're starting to suspect you're killing off your wife. <laughs> 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 but again, there's always the exceptions. There, there, there are exceptions. So, yeah, you know, uh, but yeah, I mean, normally we'd say three. But I don't think has anyone had the misfortune. But Apart from Henry, <laughs> King Henry. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, loads of just general rules. I suppose he didn't have any options but to start his own church. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. But yeah, for a long time it, it was, uh, I remember in Cyprus, I had relatives in Cyprus who had very abusive husbands, you know, alcoholics, and beating them, cheating on them when they were pregnant. Uh, and they felt, unfortunately, divorce was still so frowned upon that they only got divorced uh, civilly and remarried civilly because it was still such a stigma to get divorced and remarried in Cyprus at that time. And we're talking about a time when uh, I had, had relatives who were forced into marriages at the age of 14 uh, with very abusive people. And strictly speaking, this should never be allowed to happen in the church. One of the, the, one of the key things in a marriage is that both the husband and wife have to be willing. If someone's being forced, we should not, strictly speaking, we should not allow, we should not bless the marriage. But it happened a lot in these kind of societies. Um, like I said, these are the two extremes we have to avoid. The one is where we refuse to engage with the real problems that someone has, and to the point where they feel we can't even go to the church for a divorce. Uh, and the other one is where we just become really, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter, uh, and not, not even trying to reconcile. Uh, the couple. The problem we have in this country is because, like I said, I mean, civil and religious ceremony are separate, and most of the people who get married in the church, quite frankly, are not church church people. They don't really have any relationship with the church. And you now, by the time that they've come to get a divorce, they've already remarried civilly. They've already got a child with another person. It's like, well, what we're going to do? I mean, saying no would. I mean, it's just like the lesser of two evils. So. We basically have to give our uh, the blessing for a divorce because sort of the ideally what should happen these people should you know have a relationship with us come to us for help and we can try to sort of help them resolve their problems and of course you can go to marriage counsellors there's nothing wrong with that as well but I mean it's important that there's a relationship with the church 
Um, one of the significant uh, important things about the, the priest leading the couple around the altar is that you know, the church is there for you for the rest of your life, that you, you're going to follow in the ways of the church. And when there are you know, marriage problems, you know, the priests can, can try to do their best to sort of to reconcile it. And marriage counseling, you know, people think you know, marriage counseling is for professionals, but there's the spiritual element. When, when a couple take their faith seriously and therefore the, the religious aspect of their married life seriously, then what the priest has to say is important. Um, so if there's that ideal of the, the couple being involved in the church, it, it's obviously much better. The reality is, like I said, you know, we've, we've separated marriage from the Eucharist, you can marry anybody whether they believe in the church or not, and what you end up with is, you know, a lot of records, you know, but no relationship with people. people. just get married for the sake of it as well, they don't actually mm. do it for the spiritual reasons. I think they just think, oh, let, we might as well get married, but then they don't, yeah. um, you know, like, we go to church together, yeah. they don't... That's the thing, the, the idea of the, what marriage is all about, the shared life, the common life, doesn't seem to be there. We, we begin eating our food with a prayer and with a blessing, asking blessing for God, we wouldn't start our life without a blessing. Exactly. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I know most of my friends that are married, that, that it's just... It's just really, yeah. yeah. Can I ask you, uh, what is the case of marriage in priesthood in the Orthodox Church? If you can be either married or unmarried priest, how, how does it work? Yeah, normally, for a long time, the norm was that priests always married men. Um, and then it became more common for monks to be appointed as priests. The idea of people that are neither monastics or, or married being just having celibate priests is much rarer, but it's becoming a bit more common okay. in some places. Um, and the idea is that, you know, basically a married person can be, become a priest, but a priest can't get married. So you marry before ordination only. Um, I think yeah, it's still there is an increasing number of weirdos like me who are just celibate and not married or monastics. Um, but it is a bit concerning, uh, to be honest, because I mean I do I just do, I just wonder why it is uh, on the increase. Um, the idea of priests who who are are not married or monastic. There are always exceptions, but again, there's this idea. I mean, I know so many like monk priests who are appointed in parishes, and they're always going on saying how wonderful the monastic life is, and oh yes, we should all be in monasteries. And I think, well, what are you doing here then? You know, uh, and I don't understand why people that uh, claim to love monasticism are, are living in parishes. Um, and I wonder, you know, why if is is there the increase in in unmarried priests? a result of people not being able to find suitable wives and so on. Again, I, I fear that there's, there are negative elements, that people are settling for celibacy, which is obviously very dangerous. Uh, but I, I guess I, I know from Greece that, uh, you know, at least the, all the older priests that have a higher hierarchy in the church, they're all celibate. The bishop, yeah, bishops. So you can't be a bishop without being uh, unmarried. So there is a reason for being celibate if, if you are going to bishop with... Um, yeah. Dedicating your life into the church. But then some people, I mean, no, just first to speak, and we, one of my last friends, they're Greek family who lived in Australia. They had one son that I didn't meet when I was over there a couple of years ago. Came over, he was into bands, he wanted to do folk music, rock music, and stuff, with a really great chat. Was just sitting on the sofa, and I was thinking, you know what, the questions you're asking, it was just, I knew what he was going to say mm. when he was coming in Europe. I was like, where are you going? He's like, I'm going to go to Mount Athos, it's expensive. And I thought, you know, you're not going to leave there because you're, <laughs> you're on that. You're on that. Like, you could just feel it. Yeah. And guess what? Um, we got a phone call at about one o'clock in the morning from his mum in tears. Yeah. You know, saying, you know, uh, he's, he's not going back. He's going to be like. But it, clearly for him, it was a calling. Mm -hmm. But you could feel it even talking to him. You know, you could see it. So there are people who are just. Since we you mentioned this, something I do. This idea of calling mm. is also a very dangerous one. Mm -hmm. It's very dangerous because the, there can be a lot of you know, deluded ideas. Now, when we talk about callings in the church, normally what we are talking about or should be talking about is a calling from the church. It's not this 
calling from God as such because anyone, I mean, I, I hear Christians all the time, I have a calling to be an entrepreneur, I have a calling to be an actor, I have a calling to be a millionaire, you know, and it's basically, <laughs> basically anything I want I call a calling to give it some, you know, credibility. Well, <laughs> yeah, everyone talks about God's will. Uh, you know, and a lot of people that feel I'm, I'm called to be a priest, but they're just totally unsuitable for the priesthood. Uh, complete disasters. And it's important that we have the humility to accept my calling comes from the church. If the family, that's the church, basically say you should be, if you are called to do this, or you should be doing that, uh, you accept. Um, but you shouldn't go around saying, you know, I'm adamant, you know, people that, you know, have you know, should not be priests whatsoever, but you know, break, you know, breached all of the canons and everything, and saying I must be a priest. You know, there's got to be a point where we have to stop and say maybe I'm wrong. You know. Yes. So yeah, this idea of calling is something we have to be careful of. Nothing. <laughs> and in Greece, why is it that women like uh, wear black clothes after their husband dies, and they think it's a really bad thing? Even the Christian Orthodox Church um, says you can marry three times. That they think it's really a bad thing if they don't marry again, and they just even if they, if they're really young and their husband died at the, in the war when they were like twenty something years old, yeah. and they just think that's it now. Um, my life is over. I'm gonna put, yeah. you know, um, I'm not sure that's. They do that. Yeah. Well, it's not so strong anymore, from, though, is it? I mean, it's where still. I'm from in Cree, even the younger like young ladies. Um, yeah, because the community frowns upon them, yeah. and they think she's a bad woman. You know she, didn't care, she didn't love her husband. She's not a good woman because. Uh, Wow, she's getting married again. Yeah. In yeah. Crete, not in Athens, it happens. There's a, there's a, a lot. I think it's a Cypriot um, soap opera, something. Again, yeah. I was watching in Greece. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't understand the word, even my wife couldn't understand. Because um, she's some kids with but uh, And it was like this thing set in the 50s or 60s where a lot of women from one village, they, they, they lost their husbands or something. Something happened in the war, and they got all these men after them, you know, and they don't want anything to do with them. It's quite funny. For me, this situation, but, yeah. this situation can have two things. Either they won't get married because they think that the villains will speak bad That's about them. But the is. other side of the coin is that that shows me that these girls had actually faith to their marriage. No, and their no, husband. but that's a, I'm saying that's yeah. a good thing. For me, if that is. If, they, if you feel like yeah. doing that, of also course, there's, uh, there's another, because of the community. Yeah. Another thing to bear in mind in the early church, widows were a really important position. It wasn't just someone who'd lost their husband. They were, you'd see them referred to, like uh, in, in the scriptures and in early Christian texts, it's always referring to widows, deaconesses, uh, and they almost like took on a special role within the church. Since they were now widowed, they almost became like semi-monastic, and they had a special role within the church. They, they would do a lot of, dedicate a lot of time to the church that other people didn't have the time for. And it almost became a position the widow. It became seen in that way. And it's possible that it's something that they've inherited from that, this idea that I'm a widow and now, you know, what I should do with my time instead of looking for another husband, although it's perfectly fine to do so, is to instead give my life more to the church. And, and that's what they do. In and a lot of them great. do, that. do yeah. that. So the, it that's shouldn't that's be seen, uh, you know, purely as a negative thing. I mean, it, it is not nice if it's imposed from outside as this, you know, this sort of stigma. But I've, my experience has been that they're never stigmatized, that they're actually looked up to, these I think widows. And I think the black outfit is, is to show that, to show that they are, who they are, what they are, they have a position. And most of them, that's what they have done. Yeah. Like, even and they're habits, quite honoured members of the know, community. I would do things like, oh, my husband died, and then she took the black clothes off, and she was wearing colourful clothes, and oh, that's yeah. such a bad Yeah, well, yeah, that's a, like, that's a bit extreme as well. It's extreme. Yeah. I think about a year, isn't it? It's usually a year... Well, somewhere all that. Some for the rest of the lives. Yeah. For family, yeah. obviously, if it's close husband and wife. Then. But you see that there as well. I mean, well, I did when I was growing up, so it wasn't, it's not something that's so rare that I never saw, but mm. you only see it over there. Oh, really? Do you see it here as well? Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, I didn't realise that. Got me from the front. Well, I see a lot of these things are almost universal, you know. Uh, not just a culture. But the man yeah. just wears the thing here. The they still do thing. that. <laughs> and then he takes it off. And then 
that a woman has to wear the black clothes. Yeah. I don't know, is that a tradition or is that... These are customs, church? this is nothing to do with it's the church. It's just customs. These are okay. customs, yeah, these are not... Mm -hmm. This is the problem we have in places like Greece and Cyprus and, and Russia, is that people are unable to make a distinction mm -hmm. between the, the ethnic customs and the local customs mm -hmm. and the actual tradition of the church, yeah, which uh, uh, sometimes they are linked, sometimes they have they're related to each other, sometimes they're just totally... Sometimes those little customs contradict the religious tradition as well, yeah. Um, and so yeah, we, we have to be careful. It's very, and it's in a way, you know, you know, when people convert to orthodoxy, these are the people that often have a more clearer perception because they don't have, they haven't inherited all those customs. All they know is the tradition, and often it's sad that a lot of the time what we call in a cradle orthodox and converts instead of working together seem to come more into conflict, you know. English people get converted and say, well, you're only interested in Greek, you know, we don't feel at home, you know, forget it. And then the Greeks say, you're converts, you don't know orthodoxy. But there's a lot to learn from each other, you know. Those who have grown up with it, for them it's, it's second nature, it's, it's nothing, you know, contrived about it, it's, it's almost instinctive. And a convert, though, also understands that, you know, they've come to the faith because they wanted to, they've believed in it. And they don't have all this you know, ethnic stuff confusing them. So, you know, it helps that when you work, you know, talk together and work together, you can get a clearer picture. And as, as Orthodox, more and more people have converted to Orthodoxy. And according to statistics, it's like one of the two fastest growing denominations in this country, Orthodoxy. Um, as more and more people have, have got into it, it has helped us to make, understand the difference, to discern between ethnic custom and and holy tradition. Anyway, shall we leave it there? Okay. Next week we're going to talk about sainthood, saints. Uh, and the week after, which is going to be the last one before Christmas, saint, we're going to talk about the Mother of God. And then we'll start again after the Theophany. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome.